Hello and welcome to the first session of the 2021 online training with the late 7 p.m. session, at least 7 p.m. German time. I hope everyone is uh, healthy and fine and uh, willing to learn some something new today um, or simply repeat what you already know. I hope you all hear me and I hope you can see me. Um, well, of course, my picture is not as important as my screen, but I guess you all see my screen as well. At least I didn't get any, any bad feedback about that. Um, the schedule, what are we going to look into today is um, the event setup in general. So we will look at uh, the event settings, very basic event settings, uh, contest settings, uh, participant settings, uh, many data fields. Um, or the data structure. Basically, we will look at the access rights. So how can you work together with your colleagues uh, or with the event organizer uh, or the timer, depending on who you are, um, the participant import from Excel sheets. Um, and then we'll also quickly look at um, a few backup options. Um, maybe some notes in general. Um, if you have any question throughout the session, um, please use the chat. Um, we will also have uh, Lisse in the chat today. Um, he's happy to answer some questions, but I will also monitor the chat and we'll pick up questions if there are any and if, if it makes sense to answer them uh, for all of you. Um, Apart from that, my name is Torsten. Uh, I'm head of support at Resizal. I'm working for the company for more than four years now. Um, I guess some of you might use uh, our solution already for more than four years, but still I hope that I can give you a good insight today and um, enjoy. And if you have any question as that, uh, please feel free to use the chat at any time. So the very first step um, in your event setup is actually creating a new event. Um, and let me go into the software. So creating a new event. Um, you, of course, need to give a name, a date um, for your event. You can choose uh, where the uh, event will take place. And then you have two options. You can first uh, create a copy of an existing event file. Um, and that really means a one by one copy of all settings and all participants good things and bad things in your previous file, uh, or you can choose from any of the six templates that we have available here. Um, so we have the standard event, which is the start and finish uh, using a set number of laps. We have the major event with start, split, and finish. Um, I think that's a marathon with a uh, split every 5K. We have a lap race with a variable number of laps. You can also enter the number of laps. And then we have the triathlon, biathlon, and a team lab race template. Actually, the templates, um, the predefined settings within these templates, of course, all can be edited and overwritten um, by you. And what we're going to look in at today is not touched by those templates. So that those templates are mainly um, um, predefining the timing setup. So timing points, uh, results, output lists, but as we're looking at the general setup today, that won't matter that much. Um, we will closer look into that, uh, I think in two or three weeks time. Um, and then that will make much more sense by then. For today, we will stick to an event file that I set up previously. And we will also use the, the same event file next week uh, when we will look at the online registration and online self-service. <clears throat> But for today, we will first define the basic structure of this event file. So when you create or when you open an event, you will usually um, be here in the overview tab in the summary. And you see a list of your contests and you see the number of participants. And once you have some times, you can also see how many participants started and how many finished. But we will now start with the basic event settings. As said, the name and the date um, you already set when you create the event. 
But with the dates, you also have the date until. And the date until is, uh, it seems minor, of minor importance, but actually it is very important if you have multi-day events. And not only multi-day events, but also an event that passes midnight. So for every race that passes midnight, please make sure to fill the date until. So assuming that we would start a race right now, which is uh, 7 p.m., and we would start a marathon, and we know that people will finish after midnight, then I would need to enter uh, the date of tomorrow. <clears throat> Why? The reason is simple. Um, in your timing setup or in your timing settings, that will allow you to um, yeah, score times that come uh, after midnight much more easily and align it with times that are uh, between now and midnight. Um, we will also look at that when once we look at the timing module in, in, in much more detail. But um, for now, it's only necessary for you to know that the date until needs to be filled if you have a multi-day event or if your event passes midnight. The event type and the logo, they don't matter that much. Um, they're more of importance for my.resresult.com, our event platform um, for online registration or also results in the event list. You can um, sort by or filter by event types and um, the logo can be used if you have one of the most um, clicked events, then your logo will be shown there. In the other box, the comments section is uh, informative and uh, this is only internal. Um, so you can uh, yeah, add some comments here. To be honest, the only thing I've seen it for was um, to keep track of revision, revisions. So once uh, you work um, more often on the same file, you try to improve it over the time and then you can add some comments here. So you keep track of what you did and when you did those changes. The weather, uh, unfortunately, that is not auto filled by the event location and the date. Um, so you can enter a weather and then you could actually call that field on an output list. I know for some sports that's, that may be uh, necessary like um, cross country skiing. I know that they usually need to report the weather uh, of the race, but in fact, for them, it would be much easier to enter that somewhere else. So this is uh, this uh, other box is really and uh, not so important and um, similar the event location of course it makes sense to fill that um, but this is only internal uh, or not only internally uh, used but also on the map on my.resresult.com but to be honest i don't know how many people actually use the map view on my.resresult.com but of course it makes sense to fill it um, and it will also be used for uh, for not really be used, but for timing purposes, um, it will. You can define a radius, fifty kilometers or two hundred kilometers around your event location, um, to show only those uh, devices in that radius. So there, it makes sense if you filled that before. What is important um, is the time zone, and um, I don't know how many people or how many from how many different time zones we are here today. Um, in this session, I could imagine that we have at least six or seven time zones. Um, for some of you, it might not be that important if you always stay in your time zone, but especially for the US, where you uh, may easily travel across time zones and you have races in different time zones um, that you manage, it is important that you always choose the correct time zone. The time zone is not only used for uh, for um, for the timing devices in a timing module, but is also used for the opening and closing of registration or the date and time when you want to publish lists. So that always refers to the time in that time zone. So if you say you want to open the registration today at 8 p.m. GMT plus one, then it would open in 50 minutes. If I would say, um, let's take Brazil. If you would say 8 p.m. in Brazil, then it would not open in 50 minutes, but probably in five hours, 50 minutes. So that's why the time zone matters. Um, and please make sure that you always set that accordingly. 
the units of measurement uh, and the special date format, they don't matter that much. Um, they're more a default, um, but yeah, the um, time zone is really necessary. The currency, of course, is necessary if you use online payment. If you don't use the online payment uh, during the online registration, and the currency also doesn't matter that much. Another rather more important uh, thing, maybe more for more advanced users, not for beginners or newbies, but for more advanced users that want to make really uh, take a lot out of this, the software are the user-defined attributes. They have been implemented, I think, only 10 or 11 months ago. They were one of the first uh, new features uh, after the lockdown came um, to Germany or one, uh, after we had the, the lockdown here. Um, what are they for? What, what can I, uh, how can I benefit from them? Um, so often you have some terms or a sponsor, official uh, sponsor event name, something like that, um, that you use at different places in an output list, in, on a certificate or in an email that you sent uh, before the race, whatever. And if you have, let's say you have 15 different locations where you have exactly the same term, like race result, online training 2021. Then you could either put it as a fixed string into all of these 15 locations, or you only call event.attribute name. So event.full name will always return race result online training 2021. And especially for next year, you wouldn't need to change it 15 times, but only one time, you would only need to change it here. And then in all your lists, in all your uh, emails, in all your certificates that will be updated automatically. So whenever you have something that is uh, used quite often, um, you can give that an own attribute or you can create an own attribute for that, just for that purpose. And that also makes sense uh, if you wanna try to keep the same structure throughout as many events as possible because that way you always know okay i have it somewhere here in my attributes and then i only need to change it here you don't need to remember which list you have where you need uh, to change the setting or you where you need to change the value so that's um, where the event attributes really make sense and then the last uh, last thing i want to talk about the basic event settings is the activation mode. I guess all of you know that you that uh, we charge one race result credit for each participant that is in an event file that is hosted online on our, uh, on our server. No matter if you use the online registration or not, no matter if you publish results or not, for every event that is online and for every participant that is online in a real event, we charge one race result credit. But we want to offer you the opportunity to, to test features in the software, to check if, if things are working properly, um, if you are happy with it, or if you have some major changes. Um, you can create an event and uh, mark it as a test event. The result is that participants will not be activated, so you don't lose credits. But participants in lists, for example, or mainly in lists everywhere where uh, participant data is published, not only the participant names, but all information that is on lists will be garbled by underscores. So you can't really make use of those output lists, um, but that's that's the downside of, of the test event. But the features will work and you as the user, you will see how, how they work and you don't need to pay for it. And once you see, okay, everything works fine, then you can change it to the real event. And then uh, we are pretty sure that you appreciate paying for the credit. That was it on the basic event settings. Uh, any questions so far? I will give you some time to think about questions. And um, in the meantime, I will uh, wrap up. So the date until is crucial for events that pass midnight to enable further settings for timing. Another important or crucial setting is the time zone um, that needs to be set accordingly uh, as it is used for the opening and closing of registration um, or the um, date and time to publish uh, lists, but also for the time of timing devices. 
Then we have the user defined attributes for more advanced stuff, uh, which is a multiplier for often used terms. And last but not least, the activation. Uh, here you define how to deal with new entries to the database. Should they be activated? Should they deduct a credit from your balance? Or should they be gobbled by an underscore because you only test a few things? The next uh, step in setting up your event is the contest settings or defining contests. And the first question that I ask myself usually is when setting up a contest, so who belongs together? Who forms a contest? And there's no clear answer to it. So there's, it's not a black white question, but usually you can say everyone who does the same distance and the same race format can be assigned the same contest. So assuming you have a marathon, but you have different age groups or different scoring options within that marathon, but still everyone does the marathon on its own. So they can all be scored in the same contest and age group rankings, for example, can be done in a different way. So everyone who does the marathon on its own, no matter when they start, especially now with, uh, with wave starts and Corona, um, you often have uh, different wave starts, different dates sometimes, but still they are in the same contest. And here in our example, we have four contests set up so far. So we have a marathon, we have a half marathon, a marathon relay and a half marathon re relay. So the difference between the marathon and the marathon relay is that in a relay, we always have three people running full distance. So that's the differentiation between the marathon and a marathon relay. And um, that is what justifies having separate contests for it. For every contest, you define an ID. The ID is uh, unique, it's a unique number. Um, you define a name, pretty obvious. And you can also define an abbreviation. That abbreviation can also be called um, similar to the name. Um, yeah. Sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes you have a, a sponsor title for that uh, contest, but sometimes you don't want to use the, I don't know, Starbucks marathon or the marathon sponsored by whatever. You simply want to say marathon because it's uh, more convenient. Um, and then you can do it like that. <clears throat> What's also important in the general contest settings is the length. So the length uh, can be defined in kilometers, meters, or miles. And the length is important as uh, we use it for the speed function, also the pace function by default, unless you give any other uh, distance there. So the, the distance really makes sense and you can also call it um, by contest.length, I think. The last line here in the general settings is the start time. So whenever you have a multi-day event, you can choose from which day that event should start, uh, that contest should start, sorry, and provide the start time of day. But this information is, as the name says, only informational. So this is only being used for internal uh, purposes. So this is used for the overview here. Okay, sorry, uh, technical issues, but I'm back here. So the, the start time and day is used here in the overview. And it is also being used in the online registration on the info page. So participants will see it on myresult.com. But it's, it, is, it doesn't play a role for timekeeping. That's why I meant it's informational. Okay, it, it's not only internal. Um, sorry, that was not uh, not entirely correct, but it's not being used for uh, timekeeping later on. Because usually you or often you can't really stick to your to your plan, and um, then it doesn't play a big role. The next uh, settings are about the participant eligibility. So who is eligible? Uh, in participating or to participate in this contest. Usually that's by gender. We have male, female, agender, or any combination of the three. And then we have a minimum and maximum date of birth. And this setting also 
is reflected on myresresult.com for the online registration. So with this settings, someone uh, who's born in 2001 could never uh, enter a race in this contest. So someone born in 2001 could not sign up for the marathon on myresresult.com. But you in the software in Race Result 12, you can always overrule this setting. So in the software, you could make someone born in 2001 start in the marathon. You will get a notification that he's not eligible um, for that contest, but still you can overrule the setting. But for the online registration, there's no way to overrule it. So if you have that, sometimes uh, participants, especially uh, uh, the youth, they are sometimes allowed within, uh, with a, a certificate, a medical certificate to also start in a longer distance, um, but then they would probably need to sign up for the half marathon and then you would need to change the contest or you need to enter them um, completely manually. The next block is uh, about the times. So we have the time rounding and time format, and they refer to results that have that don't have a deviating time rounding or time format. So by default, if there's no other settings, um, in this example, it would round all times up to a full second. And the time format, um, is your hours, minutes, seconds. And the most important thing uh, for you to know about the time format is um, the difference between capital letters or, or what? why do we have capital letters? So a capital letter is only being, um, or if you have a capital letter, or capital, capital H for hours, it will only show hours if there are hours. So if you look at the example of 35 minutes, with um, HH colon MM dot colon SS, we have 0, 0, 0, 0, But with capital letter H, it will not be shown. So with a capital letter, leading zeros will be cut. But same for the time rounding, for every result, you can give deviating um, settings. The finish result and the start result, they are used for some um, basic fields. So there's a, a, a standard field called finished and a standard field called started. They're also being used for the statistics here in the contests, so started and finished. And uh, once you have um, results defined, you can choose them here in the dropdown. If you use the splits functionality, which we will look at in, in a few weeks, um, then the finish result is by default the last split that is set up and the start result is the first split that is set up. If you have any advanced results set up, then you can always um, select them here as well. But it definitely makes sense that uh, you have at least a finish result. So sometimes you don't have a start detection, so you can also leave that empty. Um, but usually you should have a finish result and there it really makes sense that you feel that um, Correctly. Um, one question I quickly need to read. Um, okay, the question is uh, whether you can show on myresesart.com, so on the registration site, to show the min max age instead of the min max date of birth. Um, that's at the moment not possible, but actually I like the idea. Um, so I would add it uh, to the wish list uh, in case it's not already there. Um, so I'm not sure if, if we will add that feature, um, but at least I will put it uh, on the wish list. Then next uh, option here in the contest uh, setup. Um, similar to the event settings are the contest attributes now. So the contest attributes, uh, of course, always uh, refer to the contest that someone is registered for. But you can call it the same way. So we have the contest.attribute name. And in this example, I take the track record for the marathon, which is two hours, three minutes, and four seconds. So 
for someone who's registered for the marathon, if I call the field contest.track record for that participant, it will always return this time. Of course, it doesn't make sense to call the time in a list for every participant, but you can also um, add it to the, to the header uh, of a list, for example, or the, the list title, for example. And of course, you can also show the track record name here. And the good thing is for the next year, you can easily change it here, similar to the event uh, attributes, and it will uh, be updated automatically in, in all locations where you have that. And in addition, you can also compare your result to this uh, time. Of course, you need to have the right formula and we will look at, at um, fields, formula, at formulas, expressions and user defined fields and stuff like that uh, also in a few weeks. But that would be an option to automatically check if someone um, yeah, um, got a better time or someone um, put on a new record, a record for that contest. So there's an unlimited number of user-defined attributes that you can uh, create. And actually there's also an unlimited uh, number of ideas that you can realize with the attributes. Then we have uh, two further settings. Um, the first one is uh, settings for results with raw data rules. This is mainly for lab races with an um, unknown number of laps. So for example, you have a six hour race and you don't know how many laps someone will do or you have a fixed number of laps, um, doesn't matter actually, but here you can define the number of laps and you can give a minimum lap time. Um, the minimum lap time will, will make sure that the, that the software will not um, consider two detections that are from uh, within less than two minutes as a full lap, for example. So here it definitely makes sense to also put, uh, if you have laps that you put, uh, the correct um, minimum lap time here. And the last setting I want to talk about is the course map. Um, so you can upload the uh, GPS data from a GPX or a KML file. And actually it will not only be shown in the overview tab on the map. So here in the overview, we have those two uh, different layouts for marathon and half marathon. If I go here, then it gets, uh, bold or bigger. Um, so that's that's one option, but I will also look at the timing module. We will look at that in further detail uh, further down with the online training. But here with the map, it's also good that I see, okay, this is a passive track box. This is where I am located. And this is where the track is. So if I would need to set up, or if I was a volunteer and someone told me to go set up the track box, uh, I from race office could say, okay, he's completely wrong. So um, that's that's um, very handy if you have volunteers or if you don't know very well the course, um, if you get the GPX or KML file in advance, um, upload it um, in the contest um, settings. And if you define your timing points and define the GPS uh, data for your timing points, you will also see them here on the map but then it is really easy to see if someone put the timing device at the right or wrong location, even if you don't know um, the area where you are. So that was it also on the contest settings. See, there were um, also two questions. I will just leave that here because that's um, kind of a wrap up. Ah, one thing I forgot. The years plus one, the easy way to adapt data. So if you have the same race next year again, of course the minimum date of birth probably won't change, but the maximum date of birth uh, will change. So here with the years plus one, you can easily adapt that without going into every single contest and typing 2001 and going in there 2020. So that's uh, easier if you simply put the years plus one or years minus one, usually years plus one. Um, there was the question if an attribute can be overwritten by a software function or only be read. Um, it can only be read. So probably with data manipulation, you may be 
able to change it. I've, I've not tried it, um, but it's not meant to work like that. Okay, let's proceed. The next thing is the participant settings. When um, looking at the participants, um, you can, or you mainly want to look at different data fields. You, so you wanna define the data structure or the structure of your database where you um, save your participants. And then there's also BIP numbers and age groups. Actually BIP numbers and, uh, or BIP number and age groups um, are kind of data fields, but they are special data fields and that's why they have their own settings. We will look at that uh, in a bit, but let's first look at the data fields. So we, we differentiate the input fields between standard and custom fields. So standard fields are available in every single event file and there are custom fields that you need to create. So the additional fields are, cust are customizable by you. So you define the structure of your database. Then we also have fields that are created by the system like the ID, like the created timestamp or the change link. And as said, they are created by the system, so no, no need uh, for you to, to create them or to change them. There are fields that derive from an input field, like uh, the nationality, the country. And you probably know that, there's a, that there are, or that there is the field nation and there's the field country. But in fact, those fields are input fields. And they can contain either a number or actually they can contain everything like a number, a string. Um, so they could contain US, but they could contain United States of America. Um, they could contain USA. And if you wanna call the real nationality, it makes sense that you call the, the field nation dot name as the database will compare the content of the nation field and then see, okay, does that fit uh, any nation, any, any nation um, from, from the database? Uh, and then we'll return, depending on uh, the format with the nation.name would, would, for example, return United States of America. I think. And the last um, sort of data fields is um, fields that are calculated from other data, like the age. The age is uh, the difference between the, uh, um, year of the event and the year of birth, for example, or age groups are also calculated from other data, but of course also results or ranks. The, the total time is calculated as finish minus start, for example. Um, and looking at the software again, the fields, you can find the, the structure of fields uh, and um, yeah, the structure of fields here on the main window in the participants data section. Um, first, you have the default fields. We have some general settings and they are pretty much straightforward and self-explanatory. So I won't um, talk about them right now. And then you see the default fields. That's what I meant with the standard fields. Um, it's like email, phone, name as well, street, so the address. And you can activate them. If they are activated, you will see them here in the participants window. And you can also mark them as mandatory. But here it is very important to know that if you mark a field as mandatory, it is mandatory in race result 12. So in the participants window, if you manually create participants, this does not mean that this field is mandatory in the online registration. So the online registration is completely separate from that. And we will cover uh, the online registration next week. Um, so stay tuned. Um, but for here, it is only important to know that the mandatory only reflects um, the field here on participant or the field input in the participants window. The more interesting uh, things here with the uh, fields is the additional fields, because here you can really define the structure of your database and you can define the scope of the database as well. 
you can define what data is stored for a participant. This is really all up to you. If you create a new file, this will be empty. There's only one example for the t-shirt. So this is all pre-defined by, by myself uh, in preparation to this and the, and the next session. For the additional fields, you can <clears throat> create different groups. So you can also structure it a bit. Um, why? Because here in the participants window, you should uh, or you want to have a good overview. So we have the options, we have the marketing, we have virtual race data, and we have relay team information. So that uh, makes much more sense um, compared to if it was all uh, in one line, uh, in one column. You can give the name um, as you please. So that's, that's really up to you. Um, so that's all customizable here. And then every line stands for one additional field. You can easily drag and drop them within a group, but also to another group. So I can easily um, move that here. Um, and for every additional field, the type, the name, and the label behave in the same way. So you can have the type, um, or there's uh, six different types that you can choose from. We will look at that, uh, at that in more detail in a minute. Then you will give the name. The name is always the internal field name. So this is the name. This is um, the term that you need to enter if you want to call the content of that field in a list, for example, or in a certificate. The label is, as the name says, the label for that field. So here, the preferred bib number is the label, and pref bib is the name. If I look at the participants window, I see preferred bib number is the label, so it should it will show here. And then the name cannot contain blank spaces or special characters, but the label can. So the label is the description of that field. And I personally recommend to keep the name as short, but as concise as possible. So now let's look at the different um, field types. So we will start with the checkbox field. A checkbox field, simply yes, no um, field, you only have two options. Either a box is ticked or a box is unticked. And here we have uh, the box um, or the field for the preferred bib number. We don't want to say save the preferred bib number in here, but we simply want to save whether someone wants to have a preferred bib number or not, because at least in Europe, that's uh, often a feature that you can buy during the online registration. So we want to know if someone wants to buy a preferred bib number. If that field is ticked, we uh, we or we perceive it as a yes. So uh, or a one. One is yes ticked. Zero is no is unticked. And then also for all, uh, for all fields, you have some more details. Um, so first of all, whether the field is active, um, whether it is mandatory. And again, this only relates to uh, RaceResult12, not myRaceResult.com. And you can say whether it is uh, or should be a default value. So if you tick the box for default value for a checkbox field, then by default, it will be one. So by default, it will, it will be ticked. And one sentence about the active status here, all fields that you want to save data in, no matter if you only want to save data in the participants window, or if you want to um, ask participants to fill that field during the online registration, all fields that should contain data need to be active. If they are unticked, so if you make them inactive, they will not be shown here in the participants window and they will not contain any data. So not even any hidden data. The next field type that we want to look at is the dropdown. Um, the dropdown, pretty self-explanatory, uh, offers a dropdown. And here, the selection values come into place. They are separated by a semicolon. So here we would have the selection values S, M, L, and XL. <clears throat> and usually you start with a semicolon. That means that the participant has an empty selection option 
um, or at least that the field is empty when you open the online registration. If you would put it like that, so only S, M, L, and XL, the, the dropdown would start with S. There would be no empty option. And for dropdown fields, you can define the default value as well. Um, then another field type is the currency. The currency, of course, makes sense if you ask for a donation, for example. And the currency also takes into consideration the currency that you set in your event basic settings. And then it's basically a decimal number. So if we look at the participant, we see, okay, the donation um, is a number and it shows the currency. Well, the currency is a number and it also shows the currency here. For the currency, again, you can define a default value that could be anything, of course, not from a drop down because there's no selection values. We also have the text field type. The text field is simply an open text field. You can um, save anything in here. And again, you can define a default value, but for text fields, you can also um, provide a placeholder and you can provide the minimum length and the maximum length of characters for that field. What does the placeholder do? Um, the placeholder will show in light gray. We have that here for the name of the second runner. Uh, for relays. So that will show in light gray, but it will not be saved in this field. So if I call that field for that participant, it will be empty. Only if I enter something here, then the placeholder will, um, will be gone. And now the field would contain this data. So you can easily use the placeholder to, for example, show the format, how something should be entered. Like, please enter the name in the format, first name, last name. Or if you have an international race uh, and you ask for, the, for a phone number, um, please include country code. That's, uh, that's something that, that I see um, quite often. And then the two remaining field types are the number the integer and the decimal number. And I guess they're pretty self-explanatory, but the integers uh, can be used, for example, for a group registration count. We will use that in, in, in a week for the online training, uh, online registration, sorry. Um, so this is uh, an integer, as the name says. And the decimal number for a virtual distance, for example, can of course contain um, digits after the comma. So that was it about the additional fields. Any questions so far? Because that's something that, that has changed in the past. It has, uh, has been changed within the last, I think, uh, 13 or 14 months. So that, that might be something new as well for someone who used to work with the software quite a lot. It doesn't look like we have any questions on that. Uh, one remark um, here on the general settings, um, the proposed gender check, um, you may need to be careful um, as sometimes in, in your country, um, a name has or is, is linked to a different uh, gender than um, in our database. So actually it's, it's, um, it's not only based on European standards, um, but we have a database where we compare that. And of course, sometimes um, the database needs to learn new um, combinations of name and gender as well. And actually, if you change or if you if you have a name and you um, give a different gender as the database suggests, then the database will learn it for the future or it should learn for the future. Um, one question here on the selection values. Um, if, if you can um, call, for example, uh, free BIP numbers, um, that will not work. So here you really need to enter 
a string you, you, or uh, a number, but you, you need to enter fixed text. You cannot um, call a certain field here. And yeah, um, on uh, the remark about the proposed gender, um, yes, every entry that uh, has a, let's say, non-regular uh, combination, at least if we compare to the da database, will teach the database. So the additional fields organized in different groups, we have different types of fields. Uh, you now know the difference between the name and the label. And um, we also talked about the additional settings. So the next thing is the BIP numbers. I said the BIP numbers are actually a, a data field, but they are a special type of data field. Um, so we want to look at assigning BIP numbers. We want to look at BIP number ranges and using them. And we also want to look at the BIP number visualization now. So let's not talk about it, let's do it. Assigning BIP numbers, or maybe start with the BIP number ranges, because usually that's that's where you would start um, when you set up an event. You usually have a BIP number range for each contest. And um, you can also split your BIP number range for one contest into two, three, four lines. Doesn't matter because uh, you want to put some notes on there. So for example, I could uh, I had the marathon 40,001 to 45,000, but now I want to say, first 10 bibs um, of this total bib number range should go to elite runners and the 40,010 to 45,000 should go to fun runners and then I could create a pdf file and could that hand that out for example to um, volunteers during the race or to the organizer to make sure that everything is set up correctly But for now, I will revert that change. Probably the next step when setting up um, the bit numbers is uh, which bit numbers to exclude. So here you can enter either uh, ranges like that, or you can enter uh, certain or single uh, values uh, that should not be used. And here it is very important to know that these numbers will not be um, given during the online registration and not given automatically if you create a new participant. But you can always overrule these settings. So you can always create a manually a participant with any of this bit num with uh, these bit numbers. Then looking at creating new, new entries, so assigning bit numbers. We have three different options. The first one is highest plus one, second one is first free bit number, and the third one is no proposal. The first two ones apply to the online registration as well, but also for manual uh, entries to the database here in the participants window. So the highest plus one, as the name says, it will first look at the bit number range of that contest and then search for the highest bit number that is given within this contest and then add one for the next um, participant. The first free bit number will look at the bit number ranges and then look if there's any gaps in between and then give that bit number to a new participant first. So trying to close the gaps if there are any. Of course, if there's no gaps, then the first free bit number and highest plus one is actually the same. And a no proposal that can be used for uh, manual entries, because now if I create a new participant, I will first be asked for the bit number before I can enter any other information. But that only works that way if you also use the bit ranges to propose a contest. So now if I enter the 20,001, for example, that should go into the half marathon. So let's try. 20,001, and now I see the contest is preset. If I use BIP ranges to propose a BIP number instead, if I create a new participant, 
I will be asked for um, the bib, but it will not automatically set the contest. But if I choose the contest, the marathon, for example, then it will automatically change the bib to a bib number that matches the bib number uh, ranges. Change the marathon relay, it would give the 346 because we had, ah, it, it will then use highest plus one and not the first free bib number. But yeah, I said uh, it will then change the bit number based on the bit number range. And of course, you can entirely ignore bit ranges. That's uh, of course also an option. Then the last thing on bit numbers is the bit number visualization. Um, so often it's it's much easier to take a look uh, graphically. And then reading things and, and uh, comparing lists. So here we see three colors, basically. We see white, which means that number is given and the contest fits the bit number range or the number and the contest that, that fits all together. So here, for example, with the 20,021, um, the bit, range, bit number range, uh, is for the half marathon, and this participant is registered for the half marathon. So let's open that that um, participant. He's registered for the half marathon. Then we have green, which means this number is free. And then we have red. Red means that there is a participant with this bib number, but this bib number, uh, or the the contest that this participant is registered for does not match the bib number range. So the participant with 345 is not registered for the marathon relay. And if I click on it, then I see, okay, he's registered for the marathon. So that way you can easily identify participants that are signed up for the wrong contest. Maybe if, because they changed the contest, maybe it, it happened by accident, um, but yeah, you may wanna give them a different bit number. So that was it on bit numbers. The last remaining um, topic to talk about when looking at participant setup is the age group settings. Age groups can be based on five different things, either the date of birth, the age on event date, the age on December 31st from the previous year. And previous year here means the year before the event year or the current year or the age on an arbitrary date. I personally prefer to use the age on any date and not the date of birth. Why? If I have the date of birth and then for the next year, I need to change that. I can use the edit and years plus one function, but still I need to go in and, and edit it and I may forget it. So it's easier if I use the age because age for an age group usually doesn't change unless the rules for the age groups change. But uh, under 18, someone who's uh, 17 will always be in the under 18 age group. You can also have separate age groups for each contest. Um, sometimes that, that might be helpful if you, for example, have a cycling race and a, a, a running um, contest within the same event. And um, you have different age groups for cycling than for running. Um, so you can select or tick the box and then choose your contest here. And then you see, or then you can set up that for your uh, contest. Let's untick this for now and look how, how that is set up. So we have the age group name, we have the age group abbreviation, we have the gender, the from age and to age or date of birth, and we have an ID. You can call the name, you can call the abbreviation and you can call the ID of an age group. And why do we have the ID or why might the ID be helpful? Because sometimes the abbreviation or also the age group description or the descriptive name is the same. But with the ID, you know, okay, someone who's male and under 18 will be under 18 male. But on a list, you may only wanna show U18. 
And here you could uh, group um, them after the H group ID instead of the H group abbreviation. To edit selected H groups, of course, you can simply go in and change. Um, you can import from a few default H groups, uh, mainly from, from Germany or the US or Fran uh, France, or you can also import from a file if you have a file somewhere else uh, where you have uh, set up your, your H groups and you can easily export and import them here. And then the last um, thing when looking at the H groups is H group sets. Um, you have the option to set up up to three different age group sets. Why could that be helpful? Um, so usually you would imagine that a participant could only be scored in one age group. So if you are 16, you will be scored in the under 18. But sometimes you might have a, a, a second scoring or a second score and someone should be scored um, both by the age group of set one, but also of the other score. So we, I, I had that recently. I, I got a support email um, where someone had a, I think it was a 10K uh, race. And of course, it should be scored by the official um, age groups set by the governing body. I think it was the German um, Athletics Federation. But in addition, the, I think it was the local, the city that wanted to set up um, a city championship. But the age groups for the city championship differed from the ones from the German Athletics Federation. So that would be an ideal um, scenario where you would want to have a second age group set. So someone then could be um, scored both by the German Athletics Federation and also by the city championship uh, age group. So that was it on the age groups. And that was it actually um, about the basic event setups, the contest setup, and also the participant settings. So if there's no question now, we can proceed with some, I would say, easier stuff. So working together, um, what does that mean working together? Uh, of course, or often you have uh, a timer, you have a race director, you have the staff of the race uh, director uh, or uh, the event organizing company, whatever. So you have more than one, one person uh, working um, on your event file. And of course you don't need to share your login credentials with everyone. So you can assign access rights and you can allow other users to access your event file and you can limit the access rights per user. And how does it work? So if you are the owner of the event under main window, access rights, simple API, you will find this box. And here you can enter a user ID and the user ID means the race result user ID or the race result username. So Anyone who wants to access your event file needs to have a customer account with us, with RaceResult. So now I will um, grant access to our marketing account, which is uh, 3819. I hit okay. And now the marketing team has access to this event file. And now I can uh, limit the access by this, the single windows. So I can say, okay, the marketing team should only have access to the participant list or, or to the participants and data of participants, or they should only be able to access the different output lists. And of course I can add here as many as I want to. So as I said, quite easy. And obviously someone who has was granted access cannot allow someone else to access the event file so only you as the owner of the event file can um, change the access rights and adapt them and we have two things on our list remaining for today first one is the import um via an excel spreadsheet
Um, okay, there's um, coming a, a question whether the access rights um, may change in the future. So you could determine by the level of changes uh, or you can determine the level of changes um, view, but not edit, for example. Actually, that is on a wish list. And um, there was something like this uh, a few years ago, but we needed to change the infrastructure um, of the software to allow for much, much more advanced stuff, like the additional fields, for example. Uh, previously, you were only able to set up 20 uh, text fields, 20 uh, checkbox fields, um, and 20, okay, let's say 40 text fields and 20 checkbox fields. And now you have an unlimited number of fields that you can create. Um, and in order to allow for those changes, this uh, old infrastructure needed to be broken or needed to be changed. Um, I don't want to promise that it will come because it is it is um, uh, very difficult, as I have been told. I could never, ever uh, program um, something like that. But um, I was told it is it is very uh, difficult to realize, but it is on a wish list. And once uh, we are there, uh, also with the infrastructure, um, then it will, of course, come. So back to the Excel import. Um, there is a template file available in the software, but actually the template is not, uh, not that um, difficult. The only thing that is uh, necessary for you to know is that you need to use the correct field names as a header, as the column header in your Excel file. And data that you want to import needs to be in the first table of that sheet, uh, on the first sheet of the table. And it must not contain blank lines or columns. And I note some tablet versions of Excel may not work. So sometimes if, if you have um, a, a tablet version also on your desktop computer, it, it may it, uh, return an error. Uh, we have changed something with the Excel handling here or the Excel upload handling. I'm not sure if that has changed because I don't have a tablet version to verify, um, but just be aware that there might be some issues. So if you have a desktop version, um, please use the desktop version. But we will look into that right now as well. So where, where do I find that? On the main window, import participants. Now I've prepared something here already. Main window, import participants, import Excel file. So I chose my file already um, and um, I downloaded the example of an Excel table to show you how that is um, put together. So it has the first line, the headers and columns. So for each line after the, the header line, so uh, from line two and, and following, um, stands for one participant. And each column, of course, stands for one data field. So the bib, title, last name, self-explanatory. And obviously the, the um, um, example file only contains standard fields and actually quite a few, like also some bank details, which you probably uh, will not, not enter here, but you can uh, update every Data field. You can also update results through the Excel upload. And I prepared a different file for you. And I amended the file already. So I got rid of uh, columns that I don't need. And I gave my name. Okay, I made myself a bit older um, than I am. And the street, country, contest two. I can only run a half marathon, not a marathon, uh, the club. And here you see data fields that I created. And here it is important that you, not only here for all of them as well, but for the, for the standard fields, it might be a bit uh, more straightforward. But here for the additional fields, it is um, uh, necessary that you use the additional field name and not the label. So we have a field called reg language. We have a field you probably remember that was called pref bib. That was a checkbox field. And I said, okay, this is a yes, no, one, zero um, field. So one means yes, 
zero means no. So with this um, participant, I want to check that box. The t-shirt size extra large and the group rec count that was a integer. Uh, okay, let's add 275 um, as the number in here. So now we can upload that file. And of course, you can um, amend the file um, as much as necessary. Um, and there was also one question uh, now, whether it's better to use the contest number rather than the contest name in the Excel file. And I would simply say yes. Um, I think it will also work with the contest name, but I prefer the contest number um, because the contest in the software is saved as the number or is saved with the ID that you provide here. Okay, let's choose the file again. So here we have the import mode, only add new participants, only update existing participants, or add and update participants. And then a very important setting is the participant mapping. So we have uh, different options. We can either map by a bit. That means in your uh, where the software will check if in your file it or if your file contains the column bib. If so, then it will map via bib. No matter whether bib is in column A or column K or column O, doesn't really matter or really doesn't matter. But if you map via the first one to four columns, then the software will check the columns A to D depending on your settings, either A or A and B or A, B, C or A, B, C, D. And if you choose that one, for example, if you want to update the BIP number, then of course you cannot map via BIP unless your database is empty and you create all participants new. Uh, but then you need to make sure that those, uh, that data here is really uh, unique. So if I would map by one by well, let's say the first column and last name was the first column and there were two participants with with my last name and of course the software cannot identify which one uh, um, to use so last name first name often works but not always and here the last setting is uh, how to deal with unknown columns so you can either uh, abort when finding an unknown column so for example um, or yeah, imagine you don't know what is in there, so you rather um, yeah, abort the import. You can ignore them. So just to make sure that uh, everything that's correct should be imported. Or you can automatically create additional fields for unknown columns. That's, that's also an option. So now I have selected um, my file. Um, I that participant is uh, already in here, so I will delete them. Okay, but now there's no participant with bib number one. And now I can import him. And I see one participant imported, zero participants updated. Now I can go to the participant window again. And now I see my data uh, or my participant again with all the data that we have seen in the Excel file. Now we see the box is ticked. We see the venture in Excel. We see the 275 group registration count. So we're almost through. And that usually is when mistakes happen. When you think you are done, but you are not done. So backup options. Um, we basically have three different backup options. Backup num uh, or the first two ones are um, before you do any major changes. So if you are the owner of the event file on the main, uh, under overview, technical information, you can download a backup of this event file. At all times, no matter which um, operating system you are working on. So even if you're working on a Mac, that does not support uh, RACESL 12 offline, but online in the browser, you can work on a Mac. You can download a backup of the event file. You could not open it, but at least you can save it. The second option would be from the online 
uh, from a race result web server, which is um, kind of the offline software. Go to online, download an event from the event server, log in, and then select the event and tick the box to download a copy of this event uh, and the original remains online. Then if you click OK, then uh, you can um, yeah, define where to save that um, copy of the event. So these are the two backup options that are up to you and that you should do uh, regularly and before you do any major changes. And the third backup option is a backup from race results. So we also do backups uh, from your online events. Uh, we do hourly backups if there are any changes in the event file. And just in case you made a, uh, a mistake, a, a stupid mistake, for example, you deleted the whole database, you deleted all your participants, you can reach out um, to us on support at racesult.com or if you have a distributor at the um, respective distributor email address, and then we can provide you with a backup. Of course, the backups are not saved um, lifelong. So 30 days back, um, we can usually provide you with a backup of your event file. So if you have that, please uh, give us the event ID. Please provide the date and time of when you did the mistake or uh, when you need the backup. And that was it. I hope you will never need a backup from us. Um, but yeah, we have the option. And um, now I'm at the end of what I was uh, going to tell you today. I'm glad that we finished within the 75 minutes, um, which we are looking at uh, throughout the whole online training. Um, we will look at uh, session duration of 60 to 90 minutes, also depending on, on the topic. Um, so I'm glad that we, that we are right in the middle here. Um, Okay, another question. Um, yeah, my my computer um, hang now not because of the software. I I, I sometimes have uh, have issues with the uh, Windows dialog. Um, Difficult to say now. So whenever you have whenever you have issues with the software, uh, especially when you're when you're working offline, um, you can also always uh, reach out to us, and then we will probably ask you for log uh, for the log files um, of of the sports event server or from the web server, um, so we can look into it. Um, maybe sometimes we can see what you've done or if you remember what you've done before uh, the software froze then um, we can check if it is uh, if it was a bug if it if it was your computer um, sometimes we can identify what the reason was um, so whenever that happens um, always feel free to reach out to us or your distributor and um, include as much information as as you have as you can remember of course i know if you're at a race and um, the software freezes um that you might be a bit stressed and you won't remember every single thing that you did before uh, everything froze um but yeah um if you experience something like that um it's it's always a good idea to reach out to us uh, and even if we in the end cannot identify what the reason was uh, we'll do our best to rule that out for the future okay if there are no more questions, then I can simply say thanks for tuning in tonight, today, this morning, whatever it is for you. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, the first session of, of the 2021 online training. Um, I'm pretty sure there's uh, more interesting uh, things to come for you. So next week, we will look at the online registration, online self-service. Um, uh, online payment as well. All right, then thanks, enjoy the day, enjoy the evening, enjoy the night, um, have a good week. Um, I hope you have good weather and um, stay healthy, stay safe and um, talk to you soon. Actually next week at the latest, bye-bye.